Boise spread out below him, mostly on the north side of the river and mostly hidden in trees, except for the dome of the state capitol and the scattering of tall buildings downtown. Suburbs stretched northwest for a ways, and there was farmland to the west and south, a checkerboard between irrigation canals and ditches that glinted in quick flashes of brilliance as they threw back the setting sun. He turned the chieftain's nose northeast. The ground humped itself up in billowing curves, rising a couple of thousand feet in a few minutes. Then it was as if they were flying over a mouth, a tiger's mouth, reaching for the sky with serrated fangs of sawtooth granite. Steep ridges, one after another, rising to the great white peaks of the Bitterroots on the northeast horizon, turned ruddy pink with sunset. Some snow still lay on the crests below and under the shade of the dense forest that covered the slopes. Douglas fir, hemlock, western cedar, great trees 200 feet tall in spiky green. Further north and they passed the Salmon River, then the Selway, torturous shapes far below engraving clefts that rivaled the Grand Canyon. A thousand tributaries wound through steep gorges, the beginnings of snowmelt sending them brawling and tossing around boulders. A few quiet stretches were flat and glittering with ice. The updrafts kept the air rough, and he read the turbulence through hands and feet and body as it fed back through the controls. Larson stuck his head through into the pilot's area. Mind if I come up? The big man wormed his way forward and collapsed into the co-pilot seat. Pretty country. Pretty but savage. Pavel liked that. One of the perks of his job was that he got to go out in it himself, hunting or fishing or just backpacking. And you could get some of the hairiest hang gliding on Earth here. None prettier. Poor bastard. Good-looking wife, three healthy kids, big house in Portland, vineyard in Eola Hills, ranch up in Montana. He knows he should be happy and can't quite figure out why he isn't anymore. He concealed any offensive stranger's sympathy and switched the other set of headphones to a commercial station. Damnedest thing. Yep. Odd news from back east. Some sort of electrical storm off Cape Cod. Not just lightning, a great big dome of lights over Nantucket. Half a dozen different colors. The weather people say they've never seen anything like it. Mary Larson brightened up. She was Massachusetts born herself. That is strange. We used to summer on Nantucket when I was a girl. Mike Hovell grinned to himself and filtered out her running reminiscences and Larson's occasional attempts to get a bit in edgewise. Instead, he turned to the news channel himself. The story had gotten her out of her mood, which would make the trip a lot less tense. Behind her, the three Larson children were rolling their eyes but keeping silent, which was a relief. The voice of the on-the-spot reporter cruising over Nantucket Sound started to range up, from awestruck to hysterical. They really sounded sort of worried over there. I wonder what's going... White light flashed, stronger than lightning, lances of pain into his eyes, like red-hot spikes of ice. Pavel tasted acid at the back of his throat as he jerked up his hands with a strangled shout. Vision vanished in a universe of shattered light, then returned. It returned without even after images, as if something had been switched off with a click. The pain was gone too, instantly. Then he realized he could hear the voices screaming behind him very well, too well. Because the engines are out, every fucking thing is out. She's dead! And we're a smear on a mountain unless I get this thing flying again. That brought complete calm. Shut up! He worked the yoke and pedals, seizing control from the threatening dive and spin. Keep quiet and let me work. They had 6,000 feet above ground level, and the surface below was as unforgiving as any on Earth. He gave a quick glance to either side, but the ridge tops nearby were impossible. Far too steep and none of them bare of trees. It was a good thing he knew where all the controls were, because the cabin lights were dead. And the nav lights, too. Not a single circuit working. Not good. Not good. Not fucking good. He ran through the starting procedure. One step, and another, and hit the button. Nothing. Nothing. He went through the emergency restart three times and got three identical meaningless click sounds. The engine's fucked. The hell could knock everything out like this? What was that white flash? It could have been an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse. That would account for all the electrical systems being out. He sincerely hoped not. 
because about the only way to produce an EMP that powerful was to set off a nuke in the upper atmosphere. The props were spinning as they feathered automatically. She still responded to the yoke, thank God, but even the instrument panel was mostly inert. Everything electrical was gone. The artificial horizon and altimeter were old-fashioned hydraulics and still working, and that was about it. The radio was completely dead, not even a flip of static as he worked the switches. With a full load, the chieftain wasn't a very good glider. They could clear the ridge ahead comfortably, but probably not the one beyond. They got higher as you went northeast. Better to put her down in this valley with a little reserve of height to play around with. All right. The plane silently floated over rocks and spots where the long, straw-brown stems of last year's grass poked out through the snow. Listen, the engines are out and I can't restart them. I'm taking us down. The only flat surface down there is water. I'm going to pancake her on the creek at the bottom of the valley. It'll be rough, so pull your straps tight and then duck and put your heads in your arms. You, kid. Eric Larson was in the last seat near the rear exit. When we stop, get that door open and get out. Make for the shore. It's a narrow stream. Everyone else follow him. Fast. And keep your mouth shut. He banked the plane, side slipping to lose altitude. It was dark down there. There was still a little light up higher, but below the crest line, he had to strain his eyes to catch the course of the water. The looming walls on either side were at 45 degrees or better. It would have been like flying inside a closet with a light out if the valley hadn't pointed east-west, and the creek was rushing water over rocks fringed with dirty ice. Thank God the moon's up. He strained his eyes. Yes, a slightly flatter, calmer section. It ended in a boulder about the size of the mobile home he lived in, water foaming white on both sides. So I'll just have to stop short of that. In, in, sinking into night, shadow reaching up, gliding. The valley walls rearing up higher on either hand. Trees reaching out like hands out of darkness to grasp the piper and throw it into a burning wreck. Lightly, lightly, bleed off speed with the flaps, but don't let her stall. Keep control. Then he was nearly down, moving with shocking speed over the churning riffled surface, silvered by moonlight. Here goes. Race for impact! He pulled the nose up at the last instant, straining at the control yoke. They were past the white water section. It should be deeper here. Come on, you bitch! Do it! The tail struck with a jolt that snapped his teeth together like the world's biggest mule giving him a kick in the ass. Then the belly of the chieftain pancaked down on the water, and they were sliding forward in a huge rooster tail of spray, scrubbing speed off in friction. And shaking like a car with no shocks on a real bad road as they hit lumps of floating ice. Too fast! A boulder at the end of the flat stretch was rearing up ahead of him like God's fly swatter. It rushed towards him as he stamped on the left rudder pedal with all his strength and twisted at the yoke. The ailerons would be in the water and should work to turn the plane, if he could. The plane swiveled. Then it struck something hard below the surface. That caught the airframe for an instant, and inertia punched them all forward before the aluminum skin tore free. Then they were pinwheeling, spinning across the water like a top in a fog of droplets and shaved ice as they slowed. Another groan from the frame. The impact wrenched at them again, brutally hard. Loose gear flew across the cabin like fists. Things battered him, sharp and gouging and his body was rattled back and forth in the belt like a dried pea in a can. Nothing to see, only a sense of confused rushing speed. Then the plane was down by the nose, and water was rilling in around his feet, shocking him with the cold. They were sinking fast, and there was almost no light now, just a gray gloaming far above. The ice water swept over the airplane's cockpit windows. 